I told this joke before, but I'll tell it again. I think Andy will enjoy this joke. Uh, there's a kid sitting in Sunday school one morning, and the Sunday school teacher asked, hey, what are all the different names of God? So some of the kids said, El Shaddai, uh, Messiah, uh, um, Lord, Savior, all these different things. And then one of the kids popped up his head and said, Andy. And the teacher said, Andy, why Andy? He says, and he walks, Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me, and Andy tells me I am his own, right? So I always love that joke. And whatever you think of that, of that song, or sing that song, I think about that joke. So happy Memorial Day weekend, everyone. You guys are the faithful coming out on Memorial Day weekend here, not traveling, right? Or maybe you just don't want to be at the crowded cold beach, right? Beach is still kind of cold, a little crowded this weekend, so you're here, but grateful to have you here. Memorial Day is a time where we remember and honor people who have served in our um, armed services and, and, and gave their life for our country, right? Um, and, and because of their service, right, and, and these many uh, fought wars over, you know, history, uh, we are able to have freedoms uh, that, you know, have probably never been seen before in world history, right? So we're, we're the the beneficiaries of that. Like we have a, a, a member right now in Iran, right? And, and just uh, we've been trying to bathe her in prayer as she's in Iran because if they find certain things on her social media accounts, on her phone, on, on emails, right, then that could be really bad for her being in Iran, right? And there's countries like that all over the world, but we are blessed to be in America and enjoy these freedoms. We always want to fight for these freedoms, right? Freedoms of speech, right? Freedom of, of religion, right? And, and so it's a, it's a wonderful thing, and, and we should remember that and honor that and, and still stand for that today. You know, as Christians, we have um, uh, people who have come before us and fought and stood for God and actually gave their life for God as well, right? To, to kind of lay the foundation, you know, in, in Scripture talks about a great cloud of witnesses that have come before us, right? And these cloud of witnesses, many of them have given their life and stood for Jesus in the, in the midst of persecution and even death, right? A martyr is a person who volunteer, voluntarily suffers death as the penalty of witnessing to and refusing to renounce a religion, right? And if we look at Christian history, especially um, as it re is recorded in Acts, right? As in early Christian history, there's so many, uh, um, church history tells us all of the apostles but two were martyred, right? John, uh, and then also Judas, right? Judas uh, uh, killed himself, hung himself after betraying Jesus, right? So we have so many Christian martyrs, and what we're going to do today is we're going to remember them. We're going to remember two martyrs uh, that are accounted for in Scripture, uh, we're going to look at uh, Stephen, and then James, the son of Zebedee, right? Nobody here has named their kids Zebedee. I think that, that name has kind of gone by. I don't know anybody named Zebedee. Have you ever had a, a student named Zebedee, Mary? What about you, Brett? Rachel? No? Caitlin, a student named Man, we have four teachers here. Brittany? Man. Joe? Man, we just surveyed, what is that, six teachers, and none of them had a student named Zebedee. So, and that name is probably gone, but they've all had students named James, I'm sure, right? So we're going to look at Stephen, um, who was one of the first deacons in Scripture. There were seven, right? And they were chosen to serve people and treat all of them well, to treat all of them fairly, right? That's what those first seven deacons were. And he was the first recorded martyr after Christ's resurrection, right? Stephen was stoned. So we're going to take a look at Stephen, martyr, and these are the lessons we're going to see from Stephen in Scripture. Serve others, fill yourself with God's grace and power, undeniable wisdom comes from God, right? God's wisdom is undeniable. Pray for those who harm you. And number five, your suffering could bring others to Christ. These are the five things we're going to see in our scriptures today related to Stephen. All right. First, we're going to look at Acts chapter 6, verses 2 to 5. Acts chapter 6 and 7 have uh, the most account of Stephen. Okay. Um, starting in verse 2, it says, So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, 
it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Right? So if you remember this section of scripture, what it transpired is there were Gratian Jews, right? There are Greek Jews who had widows, Gratian uh, Jews. Their widows were being neglected when food was given out. Will and I just talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? Um, they, they were giving out food and the, the Greek Jews' uh, widows were being neglected uh, compared to the Hebrew uh, Jews' widows, right? Um, uh, because in the distribution of food and goods and services, they're showing favor to Hebrew widows and not Greek widows, right? And so people, right, the, the, the Greek Christians got upset about this and they brought it to the disciples and they said, hey, look, we're out there trying to, trying to preach the word, trying to reach out to people, trying to further the kingdom. We really can't be caught up in this this activity of monitoring this on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So we need seven godly men to, to wait tables and, and distribute things evenly, right? And Stephen was one of these people, right, he, um, that he was a, full of spirit and wisdom, and he's full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and they chose him to serve, right, in order to wait tables. So, you know, as a man who was full of faith in the Holy Spirit, right, full of uh, wisdom, he could have been like, hey, I don't want to wait tables, right? I don't want to wait tables. I don't want to be, be out here doing this or that, right? But Stephen served, right? We should all have a heart of service when we are Christians and we come to Christ. Because why? Because Jesus served us. He gave his life for us, right? Jesus, God in the flesh, gave his entire life and ministry to serve us and bless us and help us, right? Help us to be ultimately reconciled with him, right? So the example of Stephen is to serve others, right? Amen? All right. Next, we see, it says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Right? In the text, we see that even though Stephen was a servant who was there in the church doing these things, distributing things evenly, he was still out there in the community blessing others, right? Doing great, um, uh, he was full of God's grace and power, and he was doing great wonders and ministry in the community, right? So we shouldn't be single-faceted doing one thing, right? Even though we have a particular call, we feel that responsibility, our call is also to impact the people in our community and our surrounding and, and the people God entrusts with us, right? So Stephen was filled with God's grace and power, and there is great, there is great power in God's grace, right? When we are filled with God's grace, when we recognize who we are and what God has done for us, it changes the way we live, right? We sacrifice things, right? He served. And then through this service, through this worship, through this following of Christ, he was doing wonderful things, right? So often, when people come to Christ, they become judgmental, right? They, they, they want to tell everyone else what to do instead of just loving them and caring for them and looking for opportunities to plant and water seeds of faith, right? Right? Sometimes when, when, when people come to Christ, they become impatient with others because we were washed clean, right? So we get impatient with mess and dirt, right? But when we are filled with God's grace, it gives us the power, right, for mercy, the power for gentleness, the power for love, right? I, I, I say it so often, you know, the person that annoys you the most that bothers you the most, right? Who, who you absolutely, and makes your skin itch when you think about this person and what they do. Does anybody have like that? Have people that make your skin itch? Nobody? Come on, Joe, I know somebody makes your skin itch, right? God loves that person just as much as he loves you, right? And I have to come to grips. God loves that person 
just as much as he loves my kids, right? Just as much as he loves everyone. So when we are filled with God's grace, right, we then have the power, the power to minister to people and to have an impact, right? So the example of Stephen is to be actively work, remind yourself, fill yourself with God's grace by recognizing who you are and what he redeemed you from, right? Don't think about your current situation, but gee whiz, where was I before that? Where was I before God saved me and gave me grace, right? Amen. Then in Acts, um, still in Acts 6, a couple of verses down, verse 9, it says, opposition arose, right? So he was out there doing ministry, and opposition arose from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of um, Cilicia and Asia, were, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke, right? So this opposition arose, right? And people were trying to combat Stephen, right? And his ministry, specifically the, the Jewish leaders, right? From the synagogue of the free men. And God gave him the wisdom. Right? So under, they, they could not stand up against the things he was saying. Right? Undeniable wisdom comes from God. It's a reminder and a prompt for us to constantly be renewing and refreshing and growing in our understanding of God, our love of God, our knowledge of the scriptures. Right? That's how we are prepared and equipped when we have challenges and difficulties. Right? One of the worst things we could do is rely on the flesh when we are in a position of being challenged, especially as it relates to things of God, right? Our flesh is weak. Our flesh is weak. We'll get angry, right? We'll get frustrated. We'll deny. We will not take criticism. We will not take rebuke. There's so many things in our flesh. We become prideful, you know? So undeniable wisdom comes from God, and we must, we must first build that up and cultivate that, right? That's why in the midst of difficulty and challenges, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, how the rights were able to open their Bibles and pray, right? This, this renewed um, going to God and being filled with God, the practices of God, and, and just um, that wisdom that comes from him is undeniable, it's undeniable, and we must lean on that, but we must first cultivate that, right? So you see from Stephen that undeniable wisdom comes from God. So often we want to think about, you know, what's the best argument for this and that, right? I was talking to somebody a couple weeks back about apologetics. Actually, I've had several conversations about apologetics. You know what? We should study and practice and know these different things, but any given circumstance can have a different response, right? Apologize is defending the faith, right? Defending the Christian faith. But we, don't, we can't have a cookie-cutter answer because people are all in all different stages and walks, right? Some people are having a challenge of even does God exist, right? Some people are having a challenge of, of Christ's divinity. Some people are having, you know, different challenges are angry with God because of, of circumstances in life, right? All different things. And so when we rely on God, he gives us the wisdom on how to respond and what to say, right? He gives us that grace and that wisdom. I think something happened on the clicker, Mark. Next slide. All right, there we go. All right. Next we see Stephen prayed for those who harmed him. After Stephen was um, brought in by the synagogue leaders he, for talking about Jesus, right? He gave them a, a message and they stood on the word of God. And then they responded in anger and hate towards Stephen. And they began to stone him, right? I see in uh, verse 59, it says, While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Right? 
Imagine that. Right? You're doing the work of God. You're filled with God's wisdom and, and, and grace and power. And you're doing all these things for the Lord. Right? People oppose you. Right? You stand on the word of God. You, 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 you talk to them about God. And then how do they respond and what do they do? They kill him. Right? And in the process of being killed by these people, he reflected Jesus Christ and what Jesus prayed on the cross, right? And he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them, right? How often do we hold sins against people for so much less? Anybody else been there? Right? Man, that person cut me off, and you're thinking about it for like the next hour, right? That person did that. Right? Or, or, you know, people do all types of things and just frustrate you. Right? You're standing, you're going through the grocery store aisles, and there's two carts blocking the aisle. Does anybody get frustrated? Like, and they're just sitting there looking at the ketchup and looking at the vinegar. How much time does it take to get ketchup and vinegar? Right? And you're frustrated, and, and it bothers you. You walk away indignant, like, Shh. But Stephen prayed for those who really harmed him. As they were stoning him, as they were killing him, he prayed for them. How convicting is that, Channy? You know what I mean? Like, gee whiz, it makes, us, makes me want to weep, right? It makes me want to weep when we look at Stephen in an example and his faithfulness to God. Just saying, this is a standard that we should all strive to do, right? We should all strive to do. In the midst of life, in the midst of challenges and difficulties, people will harm us. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that people won't harm us. A community that has this really good, down really good in practice, and I don't know about their hearts and their minds, is the Amish. You hear about all types of things with the Amish. Like several years ago, there was a young Mentally deranged man went in an Amish school and shot up the whole school. I think he killed like 12 to 14 kids, if you guys remember that, right? He went in there and he killed those kids. Amish people went there to, to the court and, and forgave him. They actively, actually before that, they actively forgave him. Said, we, we, we forgive you. We have mercy. We, we, we give you God's grace because of what he has given us, right? We should make this a practice, a practice first in our own households, right? Somebody does something, you don't talk to them about it 10 times. I'm not saying you do that. I probably do that more. Yeah, right? Brett, she does not do that. I promise you. I promise you. Right? Don't hold it on. Remind them and say it over and over again. Remember when you left that jelly out? Right? Remember when you did that? Why'd you do that? Right? In our own households and then actively in our life. Right? We should forgive as we have been forgiven. Right? That's what Scripture tells us. And Stephen got that, and he did that, and he prayed for those people harming him. Right? Last thing we see with Stephen is that his suffering, his suffering led to Saul's conversion. Right? A couple verses back from him being stoned, Acts 7, it says, at this they covered their ears. Right? They're talking about uh, the religious leaders, they covered their ears when Stephen was speaking to them. And when he looked up to heaven, uh, they covered their ears and they all rushed him. They dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, right? So there's this young Pharisee who, who um, adamantly and vigorously persecuted the church. His name was Saul. They're like, hey, I don't want to get this dude's blood on my coat, so here, watch my coat while we stone him, right? And we see later on in Scripture, right, Saul witnessed this. He witnessed Stephen praying for the people who stoned him, right? And later on, who does Saul become? Paul, the apostle, right, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, considered the greatest evangelist of all time, planted so many different churches. If he did not witness the death of Stephen, would he have been converted? Right? We don't know. But sometimes our pain and suffering 
is a seed that needs to be planted and watered in the lives of others when we suffer well for Christ, right? That helps lead them to Christ. Sometimes pain and suffering helps people understand the, the fleetingness of life, right? And they come to Christ, right? So many times we see in Scripture and ultimately in Christ that the greatest gift ever came from the suffering of, and sacrifice of the only person who truly didn't deserve it, right? Amen? Jesus. So we learn from Stephen that suffering, right, our suffering our challenges, our difficulties can lead others to come to Christ or become more like Christ, right? I think there's a lesson from Stephen. Serve others, right? Serve others for the Lord. Fill yourself with God's grace and power. We see undeniable wisdom comes from God. Pray for those who harm you. And your suffering could bring others to Christ. It doesn't make it easier. But I should encourage you during difficult times. One of the things that can encourage you, ultimately, Christ's grace and his salvation and his power ultimately overcomes and defeats all suffering. So our true hope is in the end, right? And in Jesus Christ because of what he's done. Next, we're going to look at James, the son of Zebedee. If we have another kid, we're going to name him Zebedee. <laughs> No, no, we probably won't do that, but we, we have talked about adopting, so that might be possible. So then we wouldn't name them Zebedee, because that would just not be. We should, I'm going to call you Zebedee if for fun, right? Z, Zach, Zebedee? No? No? All right. All right, I won't do that. Please don't do that. Don't call my son Zebedee. Uh, all right. James, the son of Zebedee. There's three Jameses in the New Testament most commonly um, mentioned. Sometimes in church history, they call James the son of Zebedee, James the Great, then there's James the Lesser, then there's James the brother of Jesus, right? But this is James the son of Zebedee. He's the brother of the Apostle John, right? He was called to follow Jesus right after Peter and Andrew, right? So James the son of Zebedee, his nickname was Son of Thunder. Son of Thunder, right? He had some passion, right? And actually, him and his brother were called the Sons of Thunder by Jesus. Uh, he was part of Jesus' inner circle. Uh, Peter, James, and John are considered the, the three closest disciples to Jesus, right? They witnessed the transfiguration when he went up on the hill. He called those three to, with him, Peter, James, and John. And he was the first apostle to be martyred, right? James, the son of Zebedee. The lessons we're going to learn from him is one, immediately follow Jesus. Don't waste any time, right? Do it right away. First, as a Christian, you're called follow Jesus, right? When you give your heart and your faith and your hope to Christ, follow him immediately. But also, as God prompts us in our Christian walk, don't waste time. Time is fleeting. You never know when it's going to be the end. Follow Jesus immediately. You see, Jesus uses us with all our faults, right? Does anybody here have no faults? All right. Does anybody here have faults? All right, right? Jesus uses us with all our faults. Three, Jesus won't grant us every request. He doesn't do it. He doesn't do it, right? There's a lot of scripture about praying to Christ, asking to Christ, you know, asking for things in faith and confidence and all these things. But hey, Jesus does not grant us every request because some things just aren't for you. They're just not for you, right? They're not for you. They'll probably be bad for you, right? They'll probably be bad for you. You know, a lot of people pray to win the lottery, right? And all the statistics say when you live, win the lottery, it's a bad thing for the family, right? Like 99% of people, or maybe not 99%, lose the money, right? And they all types of problems and issues and all these things, right? So Jesus won't grant us every request. And we see with James, the son of Zebedee, that our last days may be really difficult. This life might be really difficult, all right? First, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 21 and 22. It says, going on from there, this is after he called Peter and Andrew, he said, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in 
a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed them, right? Immediately, James recognized the Messiah. He recognized Christ, and he followed him. He left what he was doing right then and there, right? We should have that attitude, right? So many times, uh, there, there, there's been times in my Christian walk where God kind of prompts me to do something, and I don't do it, and I regret it, right? So over time, I was just conditioned to say, hey, if God prompts me to offer prayer to somebody or to offer help to somebody or to talk to somebody about something, do it immediately, right? In Scripture, over and over, Jesus teaches us, and the saints that come before us show us to immediately follow Jesus, right? Immediately follow Jesus. Any day could be our last day. Any moment could be our last moment, right? Any moment could be our last moment. Any time could be our last time talking to somebody, right? So immediately follow Jesus, right? When you feel a prompting from God, right? And obviously based in Scripture, right? And the wisdom of God, immediately do it. Take action. Take action, right? Next, Luke 9, 52 to 56, right? It says, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went into the village, right? James and John were fiery. Like, you don't accept this? Lord, do you want us to kill these people? Right? Anybody have a, you know, get frustrated like that? Like, gee, what? Let's take these people out right now. <clears throat> Christ is like, no. No. Be like Stephen. Be filled with God's mercy and grace, right? Be filled with Christ's mercy and grace. Then what does Jesus do? He rebukes them, right? Prior to this, he sent out the disciples in groups. He was using James. He was one of his innermost circles, right? One of the, the, the people closest to Jesus, who he spent the most time with. But we see faults, right? We see faults, frustration, anger, right? Call them the sons of thunder, right? It's good to have vigor and zest, right? But sometimes our greatest strengths can go too far and be weaknesses and can do damage and harm others. So even with our faults, even with our, 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 our frustrations, right, even with the things that are not great, thank you, um, even with all those things, God uses us, right? God uses us. Now, a lot of times, it's hard to change things, right? It's hard to change things. It's easy to give ourselves excuses, well, this is just the way I am. Well, I was raised in this particular way. You know, this is just my, this is just me, right? And we don't allow God to transform us. We don't, we don't um, uh, mold ourselves into what Scripture prescribes for us. A lot of times, people will read the Bible and instead mold the Bible into what they think or they feel, right? And that's not the way it should be. Right, we all have faults and problems and issues to work on, right? And God will use us in that when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. But we see that Jesus turned and rebuked them. It's not okay, right? It's not okay. God wants us to be better. He wants us to be more like him. That's our Christian walk with him. We change over time, hopefully for the better, right? Being filled with grace and mercy, Right? Who has changed over time since they followed Christ? Uh-oh. I'm worried for you, the rest of y'all. Right? We're supposed to change and get better. God, God heals us. Right? And sometimes healing is instantaneous, and sometimes it's over a long period of time. Right? But listen, we need to spend time with Jesus to allow him to rebuke, him, rebuke us. Right? And how do we spend time with Jesus today? 
through scripture, right? Reading the Bible, through prayer, right? Through prayer. And then through fellowship, Christian fellowship, right? Prayer and Christian fellowship has to be rooted in scripture, God's word, right? If somebody's a Christian, but they tell you something that's against God's word, like, hey, whatever you pray for, you will get, right? That's against God's word, right? We're going to see that, right? If people tell you things like, hey, it's okay to have an affair on your spouse, right? Oh, just go and be happy. You know, they tell you some mess like that. It's against God's word, right? You know it's not true, right? So scripture is absolutely important for us to be rebuked, right? And us to be transformed, right? It's not okay if we treat people poorly. It's not okay, right? It's not okay. It's, but it is okay to make a mistake, right? We see Jesus' inner circle making mistakes. We see people all throughout scripture making mistakes. The important thing is transformation and going to Christ, right? So spend that time with him so that you could be rebuked, right? So you could be rebuked and repent, right? Repentance is a huge thing in our Christian walk, right? We must turn to Christ, turn away from our faults and our sins, turn away from the things of this world and turn towards Jesus and walk with him, right? So Jesus uses us with these things, with these weaknesses. He does. He does. But he calls us to be transformed and to grow closer to him and more in his image. We also see Jesus didn't give James everything he wanted, right? Mark 10, starting verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask, right? They're like, we got the genie in front of us, right? This dude can do anything. I just want one wish, right? I just want one wish, right? So they, say, so they go to him and say, hey, look. They try to trick him too, right? It's like a kid going to their parents and say, hey, mom, please say yes, right? Whatever I ask, say yes, okay? Timmy, you tried that before, right? Right? Does that work? No, right? So just, it's like, Mom, is the answer yes? Or sometimes they frame it a little bit. Hey, is the answer yes? Hey, can I do that? Channy, can I do that? I don't even know what that is, right? Like, does that work sometimes? <laughs> right? Try to do that to Jesus. Right? And then they said, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in glory. Hey, let us be the top, right? We're part of your inner circle. I know Peter's there too, but Peter could be on the left, left side of you. Let me be on the left side. Let my brother be on the right, like, right? He said, let me be in this place in glory, right? So Jesus replied and he said, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the, bapti with the baptism I am baptized with? Their response was, yes, we can. And Jesus said, you will be. But these places belong to those for whom they have been prepared, right? That place is not for you, is what Jesus told them. It's not for you. You want it, but it's not for you, buddy. It's not for you. You can't have ice cream for dinner. Just can't do it, right? That's how it is, right? This, that place is not for you. It's not, it, it, it hasn't been prepared for you. It's not good for you. That's not where you're going to be at, right? When he talked about the baptism, right, the um, scripture, a uh, biblical teaching says the, the baptism of suffering for Christ, right? For suffering, for following God, just like Christ had, right? The baptism of pain, the baptism of fire, right? Other people are saying. So Jesus doesn't give us everything that we ask for, right? Some things just aren't good. That's why we have our faith and our hope and trust in him, knowing that what he wants for us is better than what we want for ourselves, right? Jesus has our best interest in heart. And lastly, our last days may be difficult, right? Acts 12, 1 and 2 says, It was about this time 
that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Right, this is an artist's depiction of that occurring, him being st- killed with the sword right in the throat. Right? Our last days, this is James, one of Jesus' innermost circle, right? innermost circle, one of his beloved disciples. Right? Jesus died, was resurrected. James was going about how, you know, furthering the church, having it grow, doing all these things. Right? In Acts chapter 12, 1 and 2, we see that he was captured and killed. Right? Even our walk with Jesus, our faith to Jesus, does not mean that life won't be difficult and that the most tragic things will not happen on earth, right? That's not what the Bible teaches, right? And praise God for that, right? Praise God, it's real. Scripture is real, and it tells us this. We learn that from James. But Jesus turns death into paradise. In Luke 23, the account of Christ on the cross being crucified with two criminals next to him, One of them mocks Jesus, and then the other goes to Jesus. And he says, do you not fear God, he says to other criminals, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be in paradise with me. Today you will be with me in paradise. If Christ, going to Christ, asking God for grace and mercy, has a criminal going to paradise with Jesus that very day, the day of his death, how much more so for James, the son of Zebedee. How much the same for all of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, right? So this might happen to us, but ultimately, the good news of Jesus Christ, the blessing of Jesus Christ, is that with him, with our faith and our hope and our trust in him, even that means we will be in paradise. So take heart, my friends. Be of good cheer. Christ has overcome. He has risen, and he is Savior and Lord of all, so trust in him. Today we saw from Stephen, serve others. Go forth and serve others. Fill yourself with God's grace and power. Fill yourself with God's wisdom because it's undeniable. It's irrefutable. Pray for those who harm you. Pray for those who harm you. And your suffering could bring others to Christ. We see from James, son of Zebedee, immediately follow Jesus. Don't waste time. Go immediately. Jesus will use you no matter where you are. So often people say, hey, I will do that later when I'm I'm a little bit more prepared. I've had people say to me, Hey, I'll go to church once I clean up my life a little bit. Once I get things in order a little bit. Hey, God wants your mess. Come here, right? It's okay. It's okay. God will use you in your faults. Don't wait. Come immediately, right? Jesus won't grant us every request. He is good. He is God. He is almighty and can, but he'll spare you from your own requests, right? And our last days may be difficult, but Christ has overcome. Let me pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for overcoming and turning death and pain and despair into paradise. We pray, oh Lord, that each and every one here can accept you as their Lord and Savior, turn to you and repent of any and all sins, constantly be renewed in you, follow you, and worship you. We praise you, O Lord, for your word, the Bible that gives us 
a wisdom and guidance beyond all else. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we can trust in you and worship you and renew ourselves in you. In Jesus' name, amen.